Thank you all so much for your patience today. I am Paula, and I am honored to introduce you to the guest speakers this afternoon. So I'm going to introduce you to Aklam first. Aklam Taraida is from Palestinian Animal League. is the executive director of PAL since May 2018. Aklam is a passionate intersectional vegan activist who, in parallel to her role at PAL, is a leader at two other Palestinian organizations that specialize in human rights and women empowerment. Following some heartbreaking stories with farm and stray animals, Ahlam joined PAL in, t in 2017 to help improve in the physical and cultural environment for animal protection in Palestine. She believes that PAL will thrive as the main address of the animal liberation movement in Palestine through evolving as a front runner for better cultural, legal, and political contest as well as a sole reference for animal protection manuals and policies. Welcome. Now I have Thank on my right, uh, Gorka Novales from NOR. She's an, he's an activist in NOR, and NOR is an intersectional anti-species group that operates in the Basque country. The work is mainly communicative, trying to broadcast the work of the localist groups, as well as creating anti-species content in the Basque language. They try to promote a bigger connection between groups and support them with the resources in order to strengthen the movement. Basque, Basque is the language in which they work, a historically oppressed tongue, and localism is the path they opt for. So welcome, Gorka. Thank you. <coughs> to my right, we also have Daniela Waldhorn. She's a psychologist, holds a master's degree in developmental cooperation and a master's degree in ethics and politics. She is a postgraduate student in applied social research te techniques at the Autonomous University of Barcelona and a PhD candidate in social psychology from the University of Barcelona. She is an animal advocate with more than 10 years of experience working for different animal rights organizations in Latin America and Spain. Currently, she works at as, as a research analyst in the re at the Rethink Priorities, an NGO dedicated to doing foundational research on neglected causes. Welcome, Daniela. And further, in the table, we have Oscar Horta. Oscar has been an involved antispeciesist and vegan advocacy since the mid-19s, and is also a professor of philosophy at the University of Santiago de Compostela. He's a founding member of Animal Ethics, an organization aimed at spreading information and promoted concern and research about anti-speciesism in academia and elsewhere, with a focus on animal wild suffering. Welcome, Oscar. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna start very quick so we can recover some of the time that we've lost. And I'm gonna start, I would like to start with Aklam. And the first question is, Aklam, how would you define your activist work? In what field do you act and why do you consider it relevant? We have five minutes for you. Thank you very much. Thank you for hosting me. And um, uh, apologies for the confusion that uh, occurred earlier according to my participation in, in, uh, in this panel. And um, I truly appreciate the way that you uh, handled the situation. And uh, I also... Uh, like to be uh, here with uh, all of you guys uh, participating in such an important uh, discussion. Um, so my activism in, in Palestine, uh, especially with my role uh, at uh, the Palestinian Animal League, um, actually uh, goes line in line with uh, my own perception about how uh, everything uh, we know is interconnected. Uh, all uh, the oppressions, uh, all uh, all kinds of oppressions, all uh, uh, forms of um, suppression and uh, discrimination are all connected. Uh, this was the case with the, the way I uh, see things since I was young. Uh, years ago, uh, I was writing about these things, uh, and I always find myself, uh, while discussing human rights, issues, uh, I always find myself um, discussing animal rights as well and how things are actually has um, or have implications on animals as well. Um, 
I wasn't a human, an animal rights activist back then, but I could I could see that there is a, a, a strong connection uh, to what is going on between humans and uh, what is being done to animals as well. I joined PAL uh, two years ago, uh, and I became the leader of PAL since um, one year. Um, and uh, as you may know that PAL actually is an intersectional organization that uh, works to empower people in order to be able to enhance the environment for both people and animals in Palestine. So my activism would be uh, mainly focusing on how to empower people, especially women, to lead initiatives, community initiatives, to lead uh, activities towards a better situation for uh, the Palestinian people and for the Palestinian animals because uh, Palestine is about, uh, not only about land, but land, people, and animals. Thank you so very much. Okay, I'm gonna pass the question to Gorka. So how would you define your activist work? In what field do you act and why do you consider it relevant? Okay. Uh, first of all, I, I also have to subscribe uh, the first words of Aglam. Uh, thank you for how you have dealt with this and uh, also for inviting us. <coughs> I'm going to try not to repeat some things uh, you have uh, said when you introduced us, but uh, it's not going to be that easy. Okay, uh, first of all, <coughs> Nor got born uh, to cover some strategic needs that uh, were not being covered in, in our territory. There were many local groups uh, doing really good stuff. But uh, there was no uh, a group operating in the whole Basque country. We so so that's what we do. We we work in in, uh, in this uh, Basque country, and uh, our uh, we have a clear and defined objective to create a strong, coordinated anti-speciesist movement in the Basque country, as well as to make it plain that the struggle for animal liberation is a political one. Okay. Uh, for achieving that, uh, we, we worked on uh, four ways, let's say. Uh, first, uh, broadcasting the work of these uh, localist groups so that what they do, what they do gets uh, farther and uh, yeah, communicating what they do. Second, uh, supporting them while also promoting a bigger connection and uh, collaboration between them. Third, uh, to bridge the gap uh, between the animal liberation movement and the rest of uh, struggles for, uh, for social justice. And finally, uh, to create a Basque uh, anti-species uh, content in, in Basque language, yes? So uh, following this, this path, we have uh, done several things, uh, as, as Paula has said, uh, mainly uh, communicative projects. No? We, we, we published the, a book. Uh, it was the uh, translation into Basque of Refugiados, the book of Tras los Muros. Uh, as far as we know, that's the first uh, anti-speciesist book uh, written in, in Basque. Then uh, we also did an undercover investigation of uh, Basque slaughterhouses. Uh, there were 11 slaughterhouses being investigated by us. And this uh, project is divided in two pieces. One is a <coughs> short film of 12 minutes, and the other is a text report. Uh, Nowadays, we, we now we are working in in another. Um, uh, we are working in a video series uh, in which we are interviewing uh, different activists of the move, of the movement and trying to cover a big range of of it. Yes, this project will be fulfilled with the publication of a documentary that uh, will address the history of animal liberation movement from an international scale to, to our lo uh, local Basque uh, scale 
and uh, also to talk a little about the, the context. No, uh, the idea is to spread, uh, uh, to talk about what is being done, what has been done, how is how is that movement in in our land. Uh, even though. Our work is mainly communicative, as as I have said. Uh, we are we we do also some uh, events. For now, on, there have been three. The first was a demonstration that uh, took place in Bilbao, <coughs> uh, the first of October of November this year, in which more than 500 persons got together. Uh, for for our context, that's quite uh, quite a lot. And inspired by this, <coughs> uh, four new local groups were created. Those groups joined uh, the 11 that were already there. So as you can see, now there are 16. There are quite many uh, local little little groups. Yes. Um, we also took part in uh, in Corica, which is an event uh, that supports uh, our our language, in which um, very different political claims are done. So we thought we had to be there, adding our uh, struggle to, to those reivindications. And lastly, uh, last week, we organized, uh, the, it took uh, place a gathering, three days gathering for, uh, for the activists to, to know each other, to exchange idea, to, to get energy. And for, the, for now on, the feedbacks are quite positive. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Gorka. Now I'm going to go with Daniela. So the same question, how will you define your activist work and in what field do you act and why do you consider it relevant? Well, I think that uh, our knowledge about animal issues and advocacy, what works and what doesn't, is, is very limited. We can carry out some helpful interventions, but there are a lot of things that we don't know, like can we compare different strategies? Can we compare uh, animal welfare of different individuals? Or do we know who is suffering the most, where, or due to which causes? Or all, are all animals sentient? What about earthworms, for instance? And eating animals will probably contribute to the end of, eating insects, sorry would probably contribute to the end of animal farming as we currently know it, but isn't that gonna cause more suffering and how likely is that to happen? Or what can we do for fishes who are the most exploited animals on earth? Uh, or how can we help animals living in the wild? Um, these are some questions that I think that uh, research could and should answer. And, but unfortunately, uh, very few people are trying to find answers for this kind of questions and about advocacy on how to improve animals' lives. And I believe that the animal rights movement will greatly benefit from having a portion of their experts working on research. And currently my activism is doing activism for activists by doing research. Um, and I try to identify ways to improve the lives of animals on a wide scale or to identify um, interesting opportunities for helping animals. And I offer advice for animal advo advocates in making informed decisions. Um, and I know that doing research does not sound very exciting. Um, well, it's not, sometimes it is. <laughs> um, but I know that I'm not saving anyone, at least not directly, and I don't get direct positive feedback of people telling me, thank you, thanks to you I became vegan, no. Um, but uh, I think in the long term, and I try to find answers and to develop methodologies and certain tools that, that, that can help us in the future to spare thousands of me mil or millions of of, of lives. And this may be too ambitious, but I think animal suffering and speciesism is so complex that uh, we need to invest in this kind of efforts. And animals need us to be as effective as possible and to have the greatest positive possible impact in our activism 
without losing sight of the long term. Okay, thank you, Daniela. Now we're going to go with Oscar. The same question to you. How will you define your activist work and in what field do you act and why do you consider it relevant? Okay, thank you and thanks uh, everyone for being here and the organizers. So, well, I work in animal ethics and the, the reasons why we uh, created this organization in the first place, uh, well, there were again uh, some, yeah, some uh, room for activism that there was there that we kind of unfortunately think that are still there. So there are some things that should be done and wasn't done at, at the time, uh, a few years ago, and we believe are, are crucially important. Uh, one of them is uh, having a focus on speciesism. That is, not on the particular ways in which animals may be harmed because we harm them or because we don't help them, but uh, rather the general viewpoint that uh, leads us to behave in this way. So that would be uh, one thing that is important and hasn't been addressed really. Second one is uh, a need to work in the academia. So, well, you know, we are actually somewhere where people may agree that working in this field is important because the impact you may have there really can be crucial. By working in academia in the right way, you may be influencing the influencers, which can you know, multiply your, your impact. Third point, and this was actually the key reason, that was our main concern, uh, we wanted to work in defending wild animals. And uh, many people uh, don't quite get what uh, the problem of wild animal suffering is because they tend to kind of confuse it with environmentalist claims. We are not uh, uh, addressing something of the kind. Rather than that, what we are concerned with is actually the harms that animals are suffering out there, not necessarily because we harm them, but due to other reasons. They may be indirectly anthropogenic reasons, but they may be also natural reasons. And this is something that has been completely uh, uh, disattended and is really crucial because the number of animals uh, undergoing these terrible harms really is appalling. And fortunately, there is much we can do for them without harming other animals. So this is a field that hasn't been dealt with until very recently and still really needs a lot of work uh, there. And then uh, finally, the other two points in which uh, we wanted to, to work as well were the following ones. Uh, the first one was on uh, working at a meta level. Uh, and this is something similar to what Daniela has pointed out. We want uh, to evaluate uh, the work we ourselves are, are, are doing, but also in doing so to provide tools for other animal activists as well uh, that may help to improve their, their, their work. Uh, also by providing them also tools that they can use so they can reduce the efforts they, they invest in, in, in that work. So that really is, 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 is important there. And then uh, finally, the last uh, point I, I'd like to mention here is uh, the global approach. So uh, animal activism has been pretty much uh, English world focused. We all know this. And uh, well, um, to be sure, uh, in the Spanish speaking world, as in other linguistic areas, work has been done as well. And the progress that has been done in, for instance, Latin America and Southern Europe in the last uh, decade or so has been amazing. But there are lots of places where we still need to work. So we are investing uh, a significant part of our resources now in trying to learn best how to act, uh, for instance, in, in Eastern uh, Asia. So that's pretty much it, I think. Thank you, Oscar. We're going to go back now to Ahlam. And the second question for you would be, what are the main lessons learned as a result of your activist experience, Ahlam? Yes. Um, I would start with the, the point that we are actually working in an occupied country. Um, we've been under occupation since 71 years. And the occupation actually followed uh, the British mandate. So we've been colonized and then we have uh, the Israeli occupation. And um, uh, uh, we, we, were, uh, we have been observing the, um, the impact of the prolonged Israeli occupation that followed the, the colonial era on uh, the behavior of, uh, for example, of the Palestinian children who were like either amongst each other or towards animals. 
this was the starting point of our work uh, by just trying to uh, go back to the roots where uh, everything went wrong. So when it comes to abusing the street, the street animals, for example, uh, we would see like two angles. The first angle is um, uh, children are just expressing the little power that they have against the animals. On the other hand, we have a, a religious and cultural issue that, for example, consider dogs as unclean animals that people don't want to uh, to be around and that people don't consider to uh, adopt as companion animals. Uh, so um, uh, at PAL, we uh, we are considering to uh, to, to discuss this uh, on a wide base. Uh, to discuss the, the religious point of view, why and when dogs considered to be unclean, while there is nothing in uh, the Quran, the, the Book of Islam, says so. So why and when people started to consider dogs are unclean, and there is a good literature on this uh, that actually uh, at some point uh, dogs were correlated with disease. So th at that point people considered uh, them as unclean, but they gave it, at the same time, a religious uh, cover, so to say. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we were uh, observing, for example, women subordination to men, uh, homophobia, and these kind of issues. So when these things uh, started as well, that was a big question. So when we try to go back to the roots, we see that uh, there is a good literature where uh, even during the Islamic era, the golden Islamic era, uh, the, the, the Islamic society didn't actually um, have uh, the, 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 the um, for example, homosexuality as, an, as a, uh, something that the society uh, condemns the way that the, society, the Islamic societies now do. Um, and we have uh, many actually uh, public figures who were actually uh, homosexuals uh, in the past. So why our societies now are more homophobic, that was another question that we needed to dig out and to put it on the table. Uh, there, is a, there is a huge literature and um, and materials that show that actually the, um, the colonial legacy uh, had uh, its impact on these issues, women's subordination to men and homophobia, uh, exactly. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, like, there is also another point that uh, I would like to point out, uh, which is uh, veganism in Palestine. Uh, so, especially intersectional veganism in Palestine. We as oppressed people, we approach to our people as long as we uh, experience the oppression ourselves, we shouldn't be uh, doing it to other creatures. And uh, when we actually explore the traditional Palestinian cuisine in the past, it was mainly vegetarian, with large part of it uh, was vegan. So, uh, and I think this is, uh, this is the case in many other places around the world, that people uh, used to consume less meat in the past and uh, list their products in the past than they do now after uh, that capitalistic world uh, transformed everything into uh, machines and uh, into a, a need for people to consume more meat and to consume more, uh, more dairy products. So, in, in this... Um, in this manner, we also go back to our traditional cuisine, the Palestinian traditional cuisine, and uh, we see that our food was a whole food, a healthy food, and uh, we try also to uh, to bring up the, the religious point of view as well, because, for example, uh, the sacrifice, sacrificing animal during the big feast, uh, Al-Adha feast, um, after the Islamic pilgrimage, we see that uh, if the point is to help the poor by giving them meat, then you are not actually, as a Muslim, helping the poor in the best way. 
So if you really want to end poverty around the world and to help the poor in your country, you need to stop consuming meat uh, and, and dairy products, of, of course. And we also bring the environmental uh, perspective uh, also on the table by showing how uh, these, um, uh, the, how uh, the factory farming are actually harming our environment. And if you consider yourself as a religious person, you should not do this to the planet that you are leaving for the next generations. So uh, this whole argument uh, was uh, a part of our own experience, the lessons learned that we uh, we, we have learned through our interaction with our people here. Because as, as I mentioned in, in, uh, in, at first, uh, people are almost 100% occupied by the idea of land liberation. So when you are talking about animal protection and animal rights, it would be a ridiculous issue for many people. Like, um, and they think that we are just like, uh, you know, people who do not have any other uh, thing to do but to care about animals. But when you bring these uh, arguments on the table, it becomes more relevant to people's lives and to people's uh, ethics. Thank you, Aklam. Now, Gorka, what are the main lessons learned as a result of your activist experience? <coughs> well, we did many mistakes then. We got many <laughs> learning uh, lessons. Uh, one of one of those could be the the lack of uh, a proper organization. It's something we have uh, learned with the experience, and it's something that can reduce very considerably problems like uh, the waste of time, power imbalances, uh, not sharing out the work, not taking enough care of. Uh, our mates, and the more organized the collective uh, is, the less problems we'll have, the, the less time we'll waste, and the, the conflicts uh, will be very reduced. So we should constantly uh, try to organize ourselves by identify, uh, identifying the, the needs we have, no? the group has. And those needs are going to be changing all the time, so we have to really rethink our organization uh, once and once again, again, again. Uh, one of those needs, it's, there's a need that uh, it's very, uh, it happens a lot that some, that is not uh, enough taken into account, and it's the caring. Every social groups, uh, group needs a caring, needs the, the rest of the group to take care of that person. And we, men, are especially uh, the ones that have a problem with this. Because of the education we have received in our lives, uh, we are potential offenders. And uh, this is clearly displayed by the huge amount of uh, violence against women and harassment cases in the movement. So there's a very big uh, work when you are an activist to do while, while we are fighting uh, against the aggression that non-human animals suffer, we have to learn how not to oppress and assault other persons. That's a hard thing. And even taking it one step farther, farther that does not mean only uh, when we are talking about gender issues, but all the oppressions we can cause. No? There's, there's a big uh, work there to do. Um, other important thing uh, could be to define uh, objectives properly and take, uh, take, take time to think out objectives and not forget them, try all the time to uh, remember them, why were we doing this, which was our objective, and also rethinking the, the objectives uh, we have because uh, uh, context can also be changing, no? Uh, there's an, a concrete objective we, we would like to question now, uh, which is the purpose uh, of getting to the biggest amount of people po uh, we can. Yes? Sometimes we are trying to get to more and more and more people, and for us, uh, this is not uh, necessarily positive. 
giving a proper message, even if that message is not getting to that many persons, can be can be more positive in our opinion. And that's especially uh, taking into account the profile of those persons. Normally, the people uh, susceptible of listening to a more radical message are the ones that are politically awake. And one of the problems of our movement, uh, in our opinion, is that sometimes it has been a little isolated from the rest of uh, struggles. Um, when uh, when Aglam, you were talking about your, your context, uh, something maybe not in the same level, but a similar happens to us when we go to some politicized persons and we talk about this problem. They, they come with the Basque struggle and with, uh, with uh, other priorities. And it's something we have not uh, really been uh, successful no? in achieving, to, to get our message into their uh, revolutionary um, uh, understanding of, of, of a change. No? Uh, we shouldn't be afraid of giving a radical message. The experience has shown us uh, how able is capitalism to appropriate of our work and benefit from it. That's why, in our opinion, uh, there should, we should be clearly anti-capitalist, abolitionist. Our uh, references should be the rest of liberation movements and not uh, that much uh, maybe other strategies like uh, the ones that are closer to religious groups or those other uh, ways of uh, communicating. Uh, and I, finally, I would like to add uh, that another lesson for us was that acting local and thinking local could be a successful thing. Uh, as I said, we, we are a communicative group. We communicate in Basque and for this reason we have uh, experienced many times a, a big pressure for us to talk in, in Spanish, to, act, to communicate in Spanish, and same has happened to many other uh, local groups from our uh, context. But the, the consequences of not doing that and focusing on our oppressed language and the language we feel, uh, our language, for example, uh, has been, has been uh, effective to get closer to those political movements. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Gorka. Dear Danny, what are the main lessons learned as a result of your activi activist experience? Well, this is a big question because, well, I started defending animals like 15 years ago and during this time, I think I've done a bit of everything from working as an undercover investigator to lobbying members of the European Parliament. But during these years, um, I would highlight two main lessons. One of them is that some animals are worse off than others. You may all be aware that there are billions of animals who live in extremely painful conditions and it's overwhelming. In general, we can say that animal suffering is overwhelming. But not all animals are in the same situation. If we consider animals under human control, around 99% of them are animals used, and um, around 99% of those animals used and killed by humans are animals used for food. And most of them are fishes and chickens. And you all know that the vast majority of those animals suffer tremendously from their very first day they are born uh, until they are cruelly killed. Um, but however, uh, our efforts are not always consistent with that. For instance, here in Spain, we have important organizations dedicating an important part of their modest budget to, for ending the use of animals in circuses. Uh, although animals in circuses account for 0.000002% of the animals that suffer for human-caused reasons in this country. So it's clear to me that in certain areas, some animals are worse off than others because of the number of animals involved because of the cruel conditions in which they survive, um, because they do not get much of our attention and efforts. 
And I think that working on those areas can make us have a much greater impact. And the second thing that I have learned uh, has to do with Disney movies and that Disney movies lie to us. <laughs> I guess you are all familiar with uh, Bambi and films like that where you can see uh, birds singing, animals holding hands and playing in the wild. And that's not as strange because as a society, uh, we have quite romantic ideals of how animals live in the wild. And I never thought there that there was a problem with that until, until I ran into Katia Faria, who's there. <laughs> and, and then I learned an inconvenient truth, is that nature is brutal. And most of the animals living in the wild die just a few hours or days after birth, and those, those who survive will fight daily battles for scarce resources and suffer from physical injuries, untreated diseases, strong weather conditions, hunger, malnutrition, thirst, and probably they will also face, face a painful death. Um, and for a bird, let's say, it's, it's irrelevant whether she suffers because of some disease or because she was shot. Suffering is suffering. And for that bird, the case of this suffering, human or not human cause, is, is totally irrelevant for those who, who are experiencing it. And most animals in existence are not exploited by humans. They are wild animals living in nature. Thank you, Danny. Oscar, the same question to you. What are the main lessons learned as a result of your activist experience? Thanks. Yeah, again, there are so many things. I, I may leave some for the, for the next round. Um, I would like to um, yeah, distinguish between uh, methodological things and substantive things. So concerning uh, methodological things, I think it's important, something that has been mentioned before, to um, address your, your target group. So um, we have this tendency to try to reach as many people as possible, but sometimes, actually often, it's much better to select um, the group that is going to make a greatest difference. So you try to influence the influencers. Um, and uh, yeah, that's probably something we are doing here. Then um, something that is also important is uh, epistemic uh, humbleness. So we are discussing strategies here. Um, and I think it's very good to discuss them, and I think it's very good uh, to have your own views challenged, even if you believe in them uh, strongly. Uh, having your own views uh, challenged only, only will make your, your work improve. But also, be respectful towards others. So be ready to challenge their views, but in a, in a respectful uh, way. And, and be in mind that you may be uh, uh, wrong, right? And then uh, concerning uh, substantive things, well, one of them that has been mentioned too, of course, is uh, that um, in addition to challenging speciesism, um, it's good to be in mind that uh, we may make uh, all the mistakes. And there is one point here that I would like to mention. Um, that is, uh, has to do with, with the future. And uh, most people work uh, considering their effect only in the present or in, in the immediate future. I mean, this is virtually universal. Now, uh, the problem with this is that the future will last for a very long time, right? And uh, um, most people uh, fail to realize that this should uh, crucially influence our strategies. And not only our strategies, but actually the aims we want to we wanna reach. Because uh, it may be that challenging speciesism may, on the long term, have a much more wide uh, uh, effect than helping some particular animals here and there. Right? Also, for instance, uh, concern for, for sexism. I think it's, it's important, and this has been mentioned too, that uh, we should uh, question our sexist uh, attitudes. Um, but I think this is important not only because of the way they may, they may be affecting some people around, but because this also may make uh, a significant uh, difference in the future. And uh, there is something I'd like to mention uh, here, given that I still have a few minutes, which is we tend to think that the worst has happened already, but this need not be so. When three factors occur, um, scenarios of astronomical suffering may occur. And these three factors are 
when there is some new technology that benefits uh, some individuals, when this new technology harms very significantly uh, wide numbers of other individuals, and when the first individuals don't care for the latter. This is what has happened with the rise of animal farming, with the rise of factory farming, currently is happening with the rise of insect farming. And who knows what will happen in the future? So this gives us strong reasons to um, resignify uh, some of our aims, uh, not just our, our methods. And yeah, I will say many more things, but I'll leave them for the next round. Thank you, Oscar. Now, the last question before we go to the public uh, round of questions for you guys. So, Ahlam, given your activist experience, what recommendation would you give to those people who want to be anti-species activists but do not know where to start? Okay, uh, that's a really good question. Um, I would say that uh, um, anti-speciesism is, um, is the ultimate goal. And when you start with it, uh, you'll, you'll um, achieve veganism in a way or another. So um, I agree with, the, with the, um, the saying that you don't tell people to go vegan, but uh, first to see what uh, anti-speciesism uh, means in the first place. Um, from my experience at Pal and in Palestine, I would say that working with children uh, is the key uh, because, to be honest, and let's let's be honest with each other, working with adults uh, is just a waste of time. To be honest, so I would say if we start to work with children, it's the key to save more time, to save more effort, and to see actually uh, impact and results on the behavior of of people. Um, so this is the first point, working with children and talking to children and uh, doing things in front of children, just to see that other, other animals they, um, are not any different than us humans, and that uh, they have lives, they have family, uh, they feel pain just like us, they feel thirst, they feel hunger. So. And, uh, uh, and we need to consider that on our daily uh, practices that we do, even at house or outside the house. Um, and uh, as, as uh, my colleagues already mentioned, it's not about only the, the animals that, um, that we talk about when we talk about veganism, but it's, it's about all animals, uh, in, uh, either in, in, the, in the farms or uh, in the streets or in the wild. So um, uh, it's about to consider our practices as humans uh, and the, the, this impact on every single creatures on this uh, on this planet. Even for myself, even insects should be considered when we are uh, doing what we are what we do. Uh, so um, it's about highlighting the fact of what humans have done to the planet to everyone who is uh, living on this planet and, uh, on, uh, and to make sure that children being a, a big part of the process. Thank you, Ahlam. So, Gorka now, given your activist experience, what recommendation would you give to those people who want to be anti-speciesist activists but do not know where to start? We, we, we would uh, encourage them to find some other activists in their zone and to form a, a group. Uh, <laughs> if there's not already a group somewhere there. But uh, yeah, for us, uh, the solution is collective. Uh, it comes with groups. It comes with non-jerarchical, intersectional, transversal groups. <clears throat> And, and we will suggest them to, to take a, a small work routine and move forward. Uh, this can be an easy and effective way to start, start doing, start learning. And uh, we consider these small groups uh, very strategical because they are able to understand 
and to adapt to their peculiarities of their local context or of their local political movement, they can move. They can more effectively uh, get together with them and and fight together. And those persons are organized. They have tools. They have social power. They they have experience. They are great allies. Um, of course, if those activists are not familiarized with the other social struggles, it will be necessary to train yourself, to train to train themselves in their topics, in the in their claims, and they will never let you get if get into their movements if if you just care about a single person, then you should care about the whole, no. But this is not only because of an strategical thing. It's it's a um, co co coherence. No, at, at the end, is is a logical thing. We we understand that there's a system that is unfair, and we want to fight that. Uh, then talk, talking from globalized visions can often be a not a strategical approach, in our opinion. Luckily. Uh, well, globalization has not uh, globalized the world that much. And that's why talking from a globalized idea can even be oppressive. Uh, can be imperialist or can be occidentalist or whatever. Uh, we will ask those activists uh, to, at the end, if, if there is a community and you want to change the idea of the ideas of, those, of that community, what you need is the, the members of the of the community themselves uh, organizing themselves and and promoting some ideas. No, it's uh, acting local, thinking local. Um, furthermore, we will ask to those uh, new activists to make a deep reflection about the system in which we live. It's something that has been uh, comment. It's, it's not about veganism. It's not about let's. Let's check the. Let's study specialism uh, in a deep way. Uh, the system in general, capitalism, how does it function, and and yeah. So this oppressive uh, system has some inertias that are, as I said before, are, are gonna uh, turn everything upside down. Then uh, we should maybe ask ourselves: Do I want to change some things, or do I want to change the system? For us, the only proper way of achieving our goals is to change the, the, the system. Otherwise, there's, there's no uh, possible change uh, in the, in the long-time scale. Uh, there's no. Uh, also, many collectives decide to moderate their message uh, because of a strategic decision. There are many other activists that do not analyze this, and, and they, should, they, should check in, they should study in a comprehensive an integral way uh, and this is uh, one of the reasons many times why uh, socialist marxist the uh, thinkers movements uh, even uh, placed openly against our claim because we are not able to uh, give them a, a deep analyze with, with at least a partially a well done a paradigm of, of, of the better world we want and they want and they should want. No? Animal liberation movement should be against every oppression. I think most of us have that quite clear. And that starts in, in the daily routine. So the last thing I will, I will tell them is to, to check themselves. No? At the end, a, a group is, is what the members of that group are, what they know, what they think, what they support. It's so difficult to get that out from there. It can be, of course, and it's strategic, but uh, there's a big work, work uh, there to be done with, with ourselves. Thank you, Gorka. Daniela, the same question, given your activist experience, what recommendation would you give to those people who want to be anti-species activists but do not know where to start? Well, somehow related to what just Gorka said, I, I will encourage them to learn from others and to surround, be surrounded by people who, who inspire them. And, but also to think critically. 
Um, do not believe everything that is said. Ask for evidence or look for it. And if new ideas arise, listen and learn. And be open to discuss and to change your mind. Uh, and form your opinions based on facts and evidence and not the other way around. Um, there's also another advice that I would like to share with you, something the real that I was told some years ago, and it was don't go to the beach. It was not uh, an advice, it was more like a social sanction, and I feel encouraged to talk about this after listening to Rocio yesterday. Um, once I was, I was told by some activist that uh, if I had time to, for going to the beach, it was clear that I had not commitment, that I didn't care enough for animals. Um, instead, I should have been leaf letting and, and, and not wasting my time a Sunday morning at the beach. Um, it wouldn't, this is real, eh? uh, <laughs> and it wouldn't be surprising that sometime after that I burn out. And during these 15 years, I have met many activists who, as me, have felt the need of leaving the movement temporarily or permanently. Some of them have left the movement, in fact. But the problem is not just burning out. There's another pressing problem um, regarding how we see when we burn out. We think that we can think about burning out as a phenomenon that happens separately from the movement. But why do people feel physically, mentally, or emotionally drained in the animal rights movement? There are psychological factors, of course, but I do believe that there is a prop this is not a, just a problem of specific individuals who do not care about themselves enough. I think that we should take a look at least at the culture of an organization and I would say uh, at the culture of the movement itself. It's the way that we treat each other. So if we start to take into account the actual environment of the animal rights movement, we will see that commonly there is no place for me going to the beach. There is no place for setting boundaries without being socially sanctioned. The problem is not just burning out, the problem is a culture of martyrdom, the belief that our needs as activists are secondary to the movement and everything and everyone can be sacrificed for the sake of animals. Well, not everyone. If you're a white cis man in a position of leadership, probably that won't happen to you at all. Um, but this culture of sacrifice encourages activists to impose unrealistic expectations upon themselves and then to blame themselves because they cannot meet those expectatives. That's, that's obvious. But we are pressured to work nonstop. We, cannot, we can never rest. Uh, if you are paid, you are probably underpaid. And you must be thankful for that opportunity. And expect to, you are expected to work until you are exhausted. And you have to constantly demonstrate your commitment, for instance, attending to every single animal rights demo or every event. And this culture of martyrdom, unfortunately, is reinforced by organizations and colleagues. Anyone that goes to the beach can be labeled as someone who has no commitment, or anyone who is showing signs of stress is labeled as someone weak. But this does not affect everyone equally. Sexism and racism within the movement are important causes of burnout. Racism, sexism, or precarious working conditions, for instance, when you cannot have your material needs covered, those things cannot be solved with more activism, with more effort, and sometimes can, they cannot be solved with more self-care, unfortunately. When we see that here we have a collective problem, I think we, we have to realize that this issue requires an entire overhaul in the movement. So my final recommendation would be keep in mind that this is a long-term race. Animals need you now, that's true, but animals need you tomorrow as well. 
so our activism must be sustainable over time. And do not believe in this culture of martyrdom. And please do not tolerate sexism or racism within the movement. And do not tolerate sexual aggressors in the movement. Do not tolerate men who get the credits for women's work, which happens all the time. And not everything is justified for helping animals. And if we are here, it's probably because we believe, we care, we believe in justice. It's because we believe in speaking truth to power. And if you're here, remember that we cannot be neutral or remain silent before situations of mistreatment or injustice. Thank you. <laughs> well, Oscar, <laughs> given your experience, what recommendation would you give to those people who want to be anti-speciesist activists but didn't know where to start? Okay. So I think I would... Um, I think we, we should uh, tackle this question in both directions. So it's not just wondering what uh, recommendations we would give to them, but what recommendations we would give to ourselves. So for instance, there's something that uh, Daniela pointed out that I um, found uh, very interesting among uh, many of the things she said, uh, which was, well, you know, if, if you're new, then listen to what all the people who have been involved for, for longer have thought about uh, already, uh, their experience, because they are useful. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, don't, don't be afraid of, of having your own thoughts. So the message goes the other way around as well. So for those who have been like long-term activists, so yeah, um, it's good that you have this experience, apply it, but then uh, yeah, you should consider what new people have to say. Even if they are newcomers, maybe they have great ideas. And, and this is often, uh, yeah. Very, very hard, really. And also for, for those people who have been involved, also, uh, well, uh, the idea would be to try to find ways in which we can incorporate new people here. And uh, I've, I, I want to insist on this because I, I said about it something already. Um, it's not just about getting new people learned about uh, what we are defending. It's also about getting new people involved. So this requires uh, um, that they are able to get easily involved. I recall when I was a teenager back in the late 80s and I was like uh, involved in some anti-bullfighting and similar stuff. And uh, yeah, and it took me some years to become vegan because I, I didn't have the information. No one was telling me about that. And I'm pretty sure there are many other people around that are in a similar situation. Uh, then uh, something else that I, that I would uh, say uh, concerning this is that, uh, and this contradicts what I just said because I mentioned something about my own experience, but it's our own experiences don't represent all the people. So we shouldn't uh, be considering when newcomers come on the basis of our experience. We should try to, to, to be ourselves on, 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 their, on their feet. And uh, concerning new people, what I would uh, say to them, well, First of all, I would like to listen to what they say, and then uh, I may have some recommendations. But first of all, I think that the most interesting thing is to learn why, why they are interested in this. Um, having said this, um, I think that my, my main, I don't know if it's a recommendation, but uh, what I would say is I would encourage people to think where they can do the most uh, good. And uh, this, of course, entails examining the different causes that are around and see which ones have been uh, uh, more neglected, which ones seems to be uh, more, more uh, significant in, in amount of, of harm, and uh, then seeing where I can do the most good there. Um, and uh, this may vary from different people to, to other people. Uh, so to, to take again the issue of, of wild animal suffering, which fits very much this description because it's a widely neglected issue and it's one that uh, affects uh, the overwhelming majority of, of the animals that are around us. Um, we uh, can see a, an easy example of, of this. So many people uh, are in a situation to help with this just as standard advocates uh, do it, you know, by supporting organizations that are addressing the, the, the field. But then uh, students may consider, well, 
maybe if I uh, get on with my studies in this, I can make a difference. And actually now, for instance, in this case, what we really need is to get people who work in biology, people who work in veterinary science, people who work in other life sciences, uh, because uh, the solution can't be achieved if we fail to create a new uh, field of study, a new discipline, which has been named uh, welfare biology. So if there is any biologist around or, or any uh, <laughs> veterinary scientist, uh, uh, I, would like, I would love to speak with you. Um, so this is just an example, but there are others. We need people in social science. We need people in other fields. So uh, what we need is people who, when thinking about, not what they'll do tomorrow, not what, I'll, what will they'll do next year, but we'll, what, we'll, what they'll do with the thousands of hours of activism that they may have in their lives is, okay, I'm not gonna make this decision on the basis of um, what I happen to like more or what is going on you know, uh, in, in my town tomorrow. I'm gonna think more about this. So that's why I, I also loved what, what Daniela uh, said about her rethinking our priorities. Mm. <laughs> okay. Uh, might be, yeah, well, uh, uh, you should rethink your priorities and have a good animal ethics, yeah, of course. Anyway, whatever, I think that's enough. I probably talk more than I should have, yeah. so thanks. It's okay, thank you, Oscar. As many as you have already seen, Achlam is sadly no longer here with us, and since we're a little behind schedule right now, I'm going to just give five minutes, if that's okay, so you can ask any questions to our speakers here. Marta, we've got the first question there. I will also like to very, very kindly ask you to keep the questions short and well, it's in for, as a form of a question, really. Like. Okay, I, I will try, but uh, this is a comment for Daniela because uh, I am one of the people who works against the use of animals in circus. And uh, I have to, to tell you, I, I am not sure if you know about that, but uh, here in Spain, a, work of, uh, a group of people have worked a lot against the use of animals in circus. We have spent many, many energies in that, and we have had uh, some important victories. Uh, we have changed the law in Catalonia. Now in uh, Catalonia, it is uh, forbidden to use wild animals in circus. Ten communities in Spain have changed their laws, so they cannot uh, use wild animals in circus. Uh, around 300 cities in Spain have also forbidden the use of uh, animals in circus. So this uh, it's important for the animals. This is a change in the world uh, of circus in Spain. Uh, we have also used this uh, to work with children at schools, and uh, children have used all these changes in, in, in law also to understand, uh, to change their view on, on animals. Animals are not toys, are not spectacles, are something different. So we have uh, used this change in the law to teach uh, children uh, about uh, animal ethics. Also, we have uh, used all these uh, changes in the law to work with uh, lots of politicians in many uh, autonomous com in many communities. Also, with politicians in the in the parliament, in the Spanish parliament, and in, in many many cities. So we have had a lot of uh, not I personally because this is a very group of uh, big group of people, uh, lots of interviews with lots of politicians, and we are using all these contacts with all these uh, politicians to begin to change other kinds of laws. So this has been also a, a process of learning about how to change laws. And we are using uh, this uh, learning process to change different laws and, and to make improvements. So uh, this is only to say, uh, I think it's not a good strategy to subestimate the work of other people. I think in the animal rights movement, there are many people with many strategies, with many uh, works, with many priorities, with many different works, and I think we should uh, not uh, obstaculize or, or uh, subestimate the work of, of, of other people. I think we should be all together and fight together and, and try to uh, reunite, our, reunite our, our forces and not uh, divide us. So this, I think I, I, I'm sorry for the, for the long comment, but I think it was necessary because of the work of so many people uh, in this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. That, that was not my intention at all. Just wanted to point out that currently we're in a historical moment when there are a lot of crucial opportunities for 
uh, farm animals. And I think it's a moment um, that we must take advantage of those and seize those opportunities that are unique for, for most of the animals that exist under human control. That was the only point I wanted to, to clarify. Thank you very much, Daniela. Do we have any more questions? Yeah, in the back. Please, please keep it short. Yes, very, very short, very practical. It's a question, I think, for Gorka. Okay, you told us that you make some activism in slaughterhouses, right? My practical question is, is very short and very direct. How do you get permission, if you get those, to go inside? And if you go inside, and also, uh, if you make um, direct work in, the, um, so in, in bigger infrastructures that exploit animals. So, practically, how do you do it? Pardon, the, the second one was, if we did practice? If you do, if you do also the same work of observation in, the, for example, dairy infrastructures or meat infrastructures. Mm -hmm. We got inside. We were allowed to get inside. Uh, of course, not uh, not not talking about what we were gonna do. <laughs> and uh, we focused on on just on the slaughterhouses because for us it was the culmus, the, 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 it was the, the top of, of of this huge. Uh, pyramid, and um, we were very interested in showing, showing uh, that this was not something from somewhere far from here. Uh, in the Basque Country, there is this rural culture of your own animals, your own. We just wanted to sh to sh to show how doesn't matter where it comes from, even the chicken you have in your. Uh, if you're little in your little farm, it's gonna end here in an unfair way. But, but for instance, I'm doing some work in, in Portugal in this kind of context, and it's very difficult to enter. Fortunately, I got some permissions in the slaughterhouse. So my question is, did you get some interviews with the workers, and did you also get to, uh, to photograph or to film the practices that are involved, if, we, if it was possible for you? The, pra the practices, the that, practices are that are that animals are suffer, practices, the farming practices. Yeah, just in uh, slaughterhouses. Of course, we, we wrecked everything. Uh, by the way, uh, the name of uh, you can find on on YouTube this short film. It's uh, you just have to check Nor and and uh, probably write in the slaughterhouses. It will it will appear then. The, the, the name is in Basque, so it's uh, Euskal Herriko Iltegiak. Euskal Herriko Iltegiak. And um, I, cannot, I cannot, because of security reasons, tell you the, the exact way, but I will, I will suggest you to be um, uh, not think in a conventional way. There are many ways in which you can enter in a business uh, with the permission of, 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 of the owner, of the worker, telling him I'm gonna wreck, because wrecking is, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I do videos, this is perfect, they are gonna be okay, you are gonna wreck, there's not gonna be a problem, but you have to be a little creative. <laughs> maybe security questions Thank for, you. for later. Yeah. Okay, in the back we've got maybe time for one more question, if that's okay, or oh, maybe we have another girl there. If okay, hello, thank you so much for, for sharing the information. Um, I'm the, the activism I'm involved in myself is most, uh, mostly anonymous uh, for the voiceless with the cube of truth and doing the outreaching, but we also do some hand sub hunting sabotages. Um, I just have a, have a question because mostly we, we um, organize our activism, how to convey people to, to either become vegan or become an activist. But uh, now, uh, since, since quite recent, uh, there's a lot of uh, stress because uh, uh, last week in the Netherlands, we had, uh, with 250 activists, we had the biggest uh, occupation of a farm. Um, well, eight, eight cars got destroyed, and now actually uh, the activism, we have to think about how we're gonna organize, not on how to convince people, 
uh, but we actually have to think of how to organize against or how with the farmers, because now the, the farmers in the Netherlands are really organizing more than they have done so in the past. Maybe because you are in Spain, which is also a very strong carnist country, maybe you have had, because for, for us this is really new, we have been ignored so far. On the one hand, it is good that, that, that because they feel threatened now, but at the same time, we are, we are really de dealing with, a, with an awful campaign of, of how we are being portrayed as, as, as animal extremists, terrorists, etc. Uh, this week even, this Tuesday, all the farmers of the whole southern Netherlands are going to uh, talk about how to have strategies uh, against us. So maybe you can share some information on how to organize as activists to convey people to become uh, vegan, but how to protect yourself and uh, how to make sure you stay safe and uh, also how to deal with these, uh, this angry mob. Who's your question for? Everybody. Uh, oh. So everybody. <laughs> I mean, well, there. I'm, I'm a bit ashamed of being the first one, so... Okay, I can say some stupid thing and then you correct me and say the right thing. Yeah, uh, so there are many different issues there involved. So one of them is, I mean, that's, that's a war of, of, uh, uh, that is taking place within the minds of the people. So uh, it's about what uh, the right people uh, eventually get to believe. So um, you may even change your, consider whether um, with your strategy, you may be fueling the, the, the response that you're getting. So that's, that's the first thing to, 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 to consider. Uh, we have some experience around, and, and um, uh, some years ago, well, some people here know that, uh, there was this uh, a huge uh, case against, the, against, well, Alma rights organizations uh, around in Spain, and uh, many people got, uh, uh, well, arrested and there were three people who were uh, brought to jail. And uh, well, some people here may speak more about that because they were personally involved in, in this. And um, the thing was that uh, on legal terms or with the use of force, it's impossible to win that war, right? But um, you may consider how to wisely uh, use your, your, your strategy in order to uh, win the, the discourse they have. So it ends up being impossible for them to present you as a, as a thug, uh, as a vandal or whatever. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that's the short answer. And the longer answer, I'm sorry, we don't have uh, enough time here. <laughs> Thank you, Oscar. We just had one more question, and we're good to go. Yes, if you may, please. Can someone get her the microphone? Thank you. Um, well, thank you for your words. My question is for Daniela and Oscar. I would like to know that, assuming that most of activists won't be researchers, is there anything we can do now for wild animals? Uh, yeah. Um, I think there are a lot of things that we can start doing now. Um, although I must say that there are high levels of uncertainty about about how to intervene in nature or how to help um, animals living in the wild. But we have had some good experiences, for instance, uh, helping some what I call liminal animals, like pigeons in, in Barcelona. Um, and there's something that we can take a look at this kind of good practices that can affect a high number of animals, and probably they should they could be replicated in 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 other locations. And there are, all, are other uh, massive forms of, of interventions like vaccines and um, contraception for other animals like wild pigs. Uh, but here we have a very very close experience about about the. Uh, 
the control of the of pigeon of, of the population of pigeons in the city, which are not animals living in the wild, but we know that they face very 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 similar harms. Um, uh, we can advocate and promote concern for, for wild animals, uh, but in this sense, I would recommend to always take into account who is our audience. Probably uh, people, a broader audience, if we ad are addressing our message towards people who has never cared before about uh, companions animals, talking about animals living in the wild might be too strange for them. Uh, but we can start um, promoting concern for wild animals among the animal rights movement itself. Because in sometimes this, this, uh, the situation of animals li living in the wild is, the, is disregarded or considered that we don't have any ethical duty to, to help them. And as you said, no, no, everyone would like to be a researcher. Not everyone will will fit uh, in in this kind of in this kind of activism. Uh, that's true. But if if there are people doing research, it's it's. I think it's more than to learn from them, to read, and be open, and also ask these kind of questions because that is something that really that that is one of my main concerns. What can we do for for wild animals currently, or who of the animals that are currently suffering are those who can we can help maybe in the present? Yeah, yeah I agree. Um, I mean, one point to add there is that, of course, it's all, always possible to, to, to help with spreading concern. So, for instance, in social media, in the internet, there is some growing content on, on this topic, uh, which you can find in, in, in several places. So, you know, giving more, uh, you know, uh, more reaching a wider audience uh, about this, this is really, really important, especially among animal advocates, because many of them, uh, even, even long-term activists, have never heard about uh, the issue of, of wild animal suffering. Then people working at universities, well, these are great places to, to, to have this, this uh, ongoing uh, debate. And then you don't need to be a professional researcher in order to help even with, with research. So some organizations, uh, well, that's the case with animal ethics, but other groups are doing this as well. Um, they are working with uh, the help of uh, different researchers who do this tiny research in this uh, uh, very concrete topic and then these other people make this tiny research. And uh, adding all together, uh, well, uh, you eventually get to, to learn important things about, about uh, this. Uh, and also, you know, to produce content again that can bring more, more people involved. So there's, there's plenty of things to, to do and uh, yeah, maybe we can talk about that later. I will shortly add that if we if we are thinking in the future, um, uh, maybe advocating for those invertebrates under human control will be a way to promote concern for other animals living in the wild in the future. I'm thinking about crustaceans mostly, who are broadly ex uh, exploded by 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 aquaculture and the food industry in general. And there are some some legislation in some well, in Europe and in other countries that protect crustaceans and also cephalopods use it in research. And I think that that is a way of promoting this kind of activism, of advocacy on behalf of uh, these invertebrate animals could pave the way for spreading concern in the future. Thank you, Dani. Well, the organizing committee asked me kindly that if anyone's going to the dinner tonight, please gather and wait outside. And I want to thank you all for coming today here. I believe we all learned a great deal. And please do practice the ethics of care. Be kind to one another and give a very big round of applause to the speakers today.